shepherd, he delivers, restores, and leads home. So, so God was delivering them out of captivity, as we talked about a little bit earlier, and they were sending disobedience, right, as they caused them. And here in verse 1, look at chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now these are the people of province who came up from captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captivity, uh, had, had taken captive in Babylon. So they're, they're coming home and they've been given this grace of God that is accomplishing this. And God had done something amazing and had stirred the heart of the king to enable them to go home and conquer and, and encourage them to support their local communities in what they were doing and providing for them along this journey. And this took about four months for them to get back to where they were supposed to be. And God had stirred in the people's heart to respond in these challenges as they were to face in many different ways. And so notice at the very beginning in Ezra chapter 1 verse 5 that we talked about last week, notice the as they returned under the leadership of the family heads. And so it says in chapter 1 verse 5, it says, then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So, all right, so here they are. They've been released. They're going back to their native land. They're going back to where they're supposed to be, where they probably came from. And here they are. They're going. And what's the first thing they're going to do? Well, they're recognizing first and foremost that I have been given freedom now, and I've been given freedom by God. So I'm going to go back to my community, going to dig my roots and develop there. And what am I going to do? I'm going to build a house of worship to God. Because God's the one that got me out of this. He deserves everything. All that I have, all that I am, all that I have is His. So I'm just going to give it back to Him. And we see this all through Ezra chapter 2 as the good shepherd delivers, restores, and leads them home. And so what we see in this time is actually this, this area and this, this leadership, family heads, expanded to 12 men. You can see that in chapter 2, verse 2. And the 12 leaders represent the 12 tribes of people of God in Israel. And they were trying to reconstitute and, and restore what once was. And God had kept his promise in getting them out what they were what they were doing and taking them home once again. All right? So the first thing we see is that God, the good shepherd delivers or stores and leads home. The second thing we see is this, the good shepherd knows his sheep by name. And there's a reason that that is such an incredible promise because you look in the book of Ezra chapter 2 and you see the list of the people of God. And this is what's important for us to understand this as, as the good shepherd knows our name. We know the mantra and identity of Christ is he knows us by name, right? So have you ever wondered why is this list there? Well, it's there because these names, otherwise forgotten and difficult to read in church, they belong to God. And the grace and faith of those that, even though they're not famous in the secular world or the history of significant people, they are never forgotten by God about anything, and they're significant to Him. And the same goes for us. Now, we are not the children of God as in Israelites, right? We are that separate, but we are His children of God as being a part of His family. Yes, absolutely. We are His, we are His, those that have been surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. We are a part of this family, a part of this grouping. But this blessing that is referred to here is talking specifically with the Israelites. And as he's going through, there's promises that we can have here too. He does know our name as well, right? So we know this, and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's a promise, right? And we know that. Look at Revelation 21, verse 27. It says, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That, that's the book you need, right? The book we need to be a part of. Because that's the ones that are going to enter eternity with God forever. And those are his sheep, and he knows them by name. The third thing we know is this, is the good shepherd cares about his sheep and 
They're lambs. Interesting about this. That co this correlation that is shown here is really Im important, and I want us to, to dive into it a little bit here. So again, these lists of names are especially important because it, it's bringing this reconstitution to the people of God as he tells us who they are and, and, and how, how many there were. So it defines and sets boundaries. This list also shows their families matter to God. Notice how many times you see here it's the word sons of. It's repeated throughout the whole chapter. And what it means is passing on the faith in their families matters to God. Because we know earlier, in earlier years, right? In, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, he took him outside, talking about Abraham, looked up to the sky and counted the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. So God promised Abraham that his offsprings would be as innumerable, innumerable, right, as the stars. And so one of these offspring would bring a blessing to all the nations of the world, speaking of Jesus. But humanly speaking, that depended on Abraham's descendants. So what's interesting, uh, I've never thought of it this way until studying this, but keeping their faith in their identity was part of that process. So in, in part, to be a part of Abraham's descendants, that faith had to continue from offspring to offspring. And it means that, yes, God knows his sheep by name, but he also cares about their offspring. He cares about them so much. And we know this, we know that it's very important because look at the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. As you walk through all these incredible, these credible names that are within, I say incredible just because they're there. And if you're part of Jesus' genealogy, you're incredible, right? And, and it's, it's really important as we see this. So, so the people of God keeping their identity and recorded here is passing on their faith. And this is important to the purposes of God. And in the fulfillment of his promises. Wow. So in order, so as a parent, right, as a parent with kids, it's important to allow and to make sure that we are presenting our faith of value to us, to them. And this is, this is where the rubber meets the road, parents, and this is where you got to tune in a little bit, right? Even the hard times, you let them know, hey, mom and dad, we're going through a hard time, and we need Jesus. I don't want you to look at mom and dad as we got it all together. Mm -mm. I don't want you to see me any different than Jesus sees me. I'm going to be raw with them. I'm going to be real with them. I'm going to make sure that they know what's going on in my life so I can present them this opportunity that Jesus is my salvation. Amen. And you need him too. This is not, I am not like, hey, you know, yeah, this is who I am. No, 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 no. No, I trip, I fall, I fail, I sin. I need Jesus every morning. So we sang that song, give me Jesus. I don't want anything else. I just want Jesus. That's why it's, it's so important for us to make sure that we have this, in, in this beautiful relationship that God has intervened in marriage of one woman and one man, one woman as the context of this sexual activity and multiplication of the human race. He loves to work families in to seek and honor him. He wants this union to bring about what God has passing on this faith in this generation to his children and its significant importance to every generation. Because who's not to say that my kin, right, the ones that God has given me, aren't going to be producing in someone else's life. Because God used me to produce in someone else's life. But when Dan and Laura Lee Bailey, who are my parents, when they were trusted in teaching me about Jesus, are they thinking, okay, well, Ben's going to be a part of somebody else's life. That's the way we have to look at it. But we are just tools based on the purposes of God to be used by him, for him. And so we can see him through us. It's not to be about, hey, look at Ben, he's doing great. No, 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 no. Look at Dan and Laura Lee. No, 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 no. Look at Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Parents, we have a unique and special responsibility of passing on our faith. And I tell you one thing, whew, you get me choked up. I don't want my kids to have my faith. 
I want them to have a greater faith. I want them to see me and my flaw, my failure, and I want them to see I want more. Yes, because I think about my folks and producing and, and, and delivering me, right, and just giving to me and just lavish love upon lavish love and grace and mercy. I know, I, I can tell you my dad's saying the same thing. I want my sons to have a stronger faith than I do. Maybe one day I'll get there. But unique parents have a unique and special responsibility to pass on their faith. God cares about his sheep, knows them by name, and also cares about their lambs. Fourth thing we see is this, is the good shepherd calls his sheep to a holy life. Okay. You know, we all, if growing up in church, you know the word holy means set apart. It means it doesn't look anything like the world. This is the life we're called to live. It doesn't look like the world. How come we try so hard to look like the world? I don't know why, but this is what we're called to do. We're called to live a holy life, separate, separate for God. So there's no uncertainty about belonging what is and, and, and what could be allowed. And we see this in this chapter 2, verse 59. And it says this, But they could not show that their families were descended from Israel. Okay, yikes. You see, these people were so ingrained in the Persian culture that they didn't even know that they were Israelites. <laughs> Y'all, that's like, that's, that's like walking in this church and I can't tell who the Christians are and the non-Christians. Or I, walking in that secular world, I don't know where the Christians are and those who are not. Because we're called to have a, a holy life. I'm, say, I'm not saying like separate, like I can't be, a, I'm shunning everybody else that doesn't know Jesus. No, no. I'm talking about that they, where is my identity found? Is my identity found in driving race cars? No. Is my identity found in baseball? No. My identity is found in Christ. And that's what we're called to see. That's what we're supposed to see. So here in this, this time, clarity has not been given on whether a, a person belonged or whether they were part of it. There was, there's not to be any type of debate. In, in, verses, in chapter 2, verses uh, 61 to 63, there was given this guidance of, of bringing on, to making sure that there's intermarriage happening. Not to the families, but to the culture, like Jewish marry Jewish. They want to make sure that this line continues to stay strong. But, but here's the issue. The issue wasn't so much as the people, but who they were worshiping. So in fact, this is, grows, and goes along with of who do you marry, and do they have the same faith? Not same faith, but same Jesus, same God. Or is he the most important to them? And so this guidance worked out. We don't understand how it all worked out. But the one thing that we do, we do know is that God's people were to be a holy people set apart for himself and seeking to follow his word and rule as he redeemed people. As he redeemed them, you're going to see a redeemed life. There shouldn't be any kind of, you shouldn't be a debate or difference here. You're going to know that my life is surrendered to Christ, or you know that anybody else here that is surrendered to Christ, you're going to know it because you're going to see it in their life. You're going to know it because they're going to be talking about it. If, if it's not, if you don't see it, then there's, where's the question? Right? There should be no compromise. The clarity should not be of whose who's they are, where's the desire, and where's the commitment. We are to know we are called to be sheep and to live a holy life. And so it's just a challenge here this morning. And the fifth thing we see is this, is the good shepherd knows his sheep need good leaders to lead them to worship. So this is huge. So as you go through, and we see through chapter, verse 2 all the way to, in, into the 63, we see all of what's going on here. We see these large numbers of priests and temple servants, despite a few Levites. They, they make up approximately a tenth of the number. And this is significant, because the people knew they were to go back to rebuild the temple and restore worship, that that would be their priority, and they would be committed to, and it would be reflected in these numbers. So as you see these list of people, these are people that are going to be going back to the temple worship, and there's servants and Levites as they come back and are being led to worship. And so here's the thing, because when we often, or we correlate and we connect to worship as, as being 
worship and song. That's often what we correlate this. This is not what it's actually referring to. All right? So it's actually talking about it's all forms of worship, but specifically we see this. It says that they were here as there were other leaders were great examples of showing that worship is an expression of a surrendered life or a holy life. And, and is, they were to be given, and they were giving generously beyond their tithe, beyond their 10% with what they were called to do at that time. So look in verse 68. It says that when they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, so uh, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings toward the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. So what do we see here is we see good examples that lead us in the right direction, and leaders are are, we need all of these type of people. And so often it's like, well, I need that kind of person in my life because I want to be able to see that connection. I want to have that good direction and that responsibility is taken seriously. See, it's important to know that the total number of returned people wasn't huge. In fact, it was approximately about 50,000 people. That's it. That's as many people that went back in Israel, that went back out of exile from Persia. Because we're talking like millions that were brought in. 50,000 go back. Why only 50,000? This might hit hard, right? First and foremost, maybe because they were sick and they, didn't, they couldn't travel. Okay, legit. That's understandable. Maybe they had dug so many roots in Babylon that they didn't want to go back. Oh. We talked about this a little bit last week, right? And talking about the whole de-churched movement that's happening in, in, in reality. In, in the past 25 years, 40 million people that used to go to church aren't going anymore. Why? Well, first and foremost, maybe they got comfortable. Maybe we get too comfortable in our own lives. Maybe, see, too comfortable, or, or maybe we're preparing the, the spiritual journey that they were getting, on, getting ready to go. They saw it as being too difficult, and they didn't want to. Man, no, that's hard. I don't want to do that. There's a great writer, Dr. Wright, in, his, uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah commentary, he writes this about this situation. It says, a similar choice repeatedly confronts us as Christians and may form a test beyond nominal and real believers. God does not always call us to security. Mm, that's hard. You see, there's work to be done, and these are promises that had to be fulfilled, and they needed to settle in a land, build a temple, and be obedient to God's ways, which is always the best way in the long run. To fulfill their calling, they needed one another's support, encouragement, and help to look to God in every new opportunity and challenge that had come. That is the church. We've been talking about vision, direction, what we're called to as the body of Christ. This is it. We are needed for one another. Why? Because we are called to support one another. We are called to encourage one another. We are called to help one another. And to look to God in every opportunity and challenge. And as someone comes to us and help, what do we do? We point them to God. We point them to Christ. We, we should be the hands and feet of Christ to one another and for those outside of our walls. This is what we're called to do. So we see this now in Ezra chapter 2. Now we take this into the New Testament perspective, which is what we're in now. We are in this New Testament perspective. We see this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says this, God's temple is sacred and you... And you together are that temple. So here's the picture, right? We know that as followers of Christ, we are the church. This building is not the church. This is just where we have chosen to gather. But we are the church. This is what we are. We are that temple. We are what, God, what Jesus has rebuilt through his precious blood. 
is this reminds us in the New Covenant times that Christians are to gather together, are here because of Christ, and that is the new temple. We Together, we are the body of Christ. We are set apart for our Savior's glory and love and to serve Him who, is always, who has always loved us. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says this. It says... Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You have been bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That, is, that testimony is saying it doesn't matter what you want. You have been bought with a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. That means when things are hard, you take that step of obedience towards God to fulfilling what he's called you to do in his life. If there's a situation that you're wondering whether I should do it or not. If you're wondering, the chances is if it's obedient to God, you better. We have to. Because if, if even pausing in obedience is disobedience. We have to obey what he's called us to do, especially when it comes to the, the nature and the relationship we have with, with one another and with Christ. It's like if you have, if you have animosity towards someone, if you don't have a, a fellowed relationship with one another, you better go talk to that person or you're sinning. You don't talk about it to other people. You go to that person and you deal with it and you walk through it. Why? Because he's worth it. Because we're called to honor God with our bodies. This reminds us that individually Jesus bought us and we have become a part of God's temple. And these things are true. And everything that we see within these verses are important as it holds us together. We have been saved through grace individually. But then we have been bought into God's family, which is the church. Now we need each other to help encourage and live for our Savior and bring Him glory in this. And so we get this picture in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you know Ephesians is the doctrine of the church, and it gives us three pictures of the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, and the building of Christ. And as it brings about this Christ being the cornerstone and being built together, bringing glory to God, this is our call as the church as we grow in number and as to, to those who have been redeemed as God saves and increases every day, who returns before Christ returns, we are not to neglect meeting together as we talked about this morning to encourage we are called to encourage support and challenge each other to persevere as we run the race of faith looking always to Jesus as it says in Hebrews 12 but see we need to see the church in a fresh and new way it's important as we're called to according to his purposes we need to play our part in being a part of the family of God so Ephesians 2 19 says this consequently you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household so we are privileged to belong because we are because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ he has enabled us because of this relationship that we have with Christ he has enabled us to become his children so as we finish this out, remember this. As, as we apply these things to our life, ask first and foremost for a fresh perspective into God's purposes in your life. Secondly, do our part in making the church a part of our family as we become a part of our family of God. And then third is to find our identity in Christ alone. We know this, that he is our hope and our found. He is our light. He is our strength. He is our song. He's our cornerstone, our solid ground. He is our comforter, our all in all. And he, here in the love of Christ, is where we stand. This, the church family matters to us as believers because we matter to the good shepherd as he cares for us. Let's close in prayer.